to sit. Um, I did set up the whole idea that today we would talk about our salvation. And we would talk about what our role is in salvation and to share it with other people. So when doing my research, I went and I looked and I found some verses, first off, to talk about really what, how should our salvation affect us? When you think about who you were and who I was, Jenny made a, a, a funny comment earlier around like when we were 18 and we dated before I was saved, what I was like. And not that I was a bad person, I, I was morally just, but I wasn't righteous and justified before the Lord because nothing that I could do, my works weren't there. Because nothing, no work could do it. And then I look at today, and when you think of yourself in that manner, then you, say, you have a really powerful testimony. Any one of us can share the gospel with anyone else with authority because you and your experience and your own salvation is powerful because you can talk to that confidently. Now, I'm going to walk through scripture, but sometimes the best testimony is looking at scripture coupled with your own salvation story. And that's a powerful way to lead people to the Lord. So if you could turn with me to the book of Ephesians, uh, we're going to go to Ephesians 1. And we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna we have quite a bit of scripture to go through today. Um, Paul Paul wrote the book of Ephesians to the Ephesian church, the church at Ephesus, and, and really the whole purpose of the book of Ephesians is to encourage you to mature in your faith when you really think about it. And if you look at Ephesians one, verse we'll read three to five. Say, think, blessed be the name of the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who had blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ, accordingly, according as he has chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be made, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. You could do a whole discussion on that, those couple of verses. But so we are, in a way, we're complete in Christ. There is nothing more that needs to be done. Blessed be God, so God the Father, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who had blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. Right there, we're blessed, we're justified, and we're going to be with him and reign forever. Right there, period. According as he has chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, so think about that for a second, even when he created Adam, he knew we were going to become saved. Even before the foundation of the earth, God could see it to the end. Because time with God is not time with us. It's not only. And of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. I don't know about you, that's pretty complete to me. Like, that covers everything. So I had a bad thought. Okay, repent, say sorry, don't do that. But move on. Like, I'm going to do something three weeks from now. Okay, not good. Not that I'm focused on the sin, but God is complete. Everything that was done is finished. It's completed. It's forgiven. In Christ, not in our own works. And it's not that we're free from consequences of sin. But we're free from the culmination of sin when we die. And, the, and that's why this... So Ephesians sets up, hey, we're complete in Christ and we're saved. Now let's go to Matthew, Matthew 11. In Matthew, and once we're complete in Christ, what is, what is, what, what's, what, what's in store for us? Well, really simply, this is, this, everybody knows this verse. In Matthew 11, 28, it says, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take your yoke, take my yoke upon you, and learn of me, for I am meek and lonely in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your soul. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. So, our souls, now, think about this in the context of your, your witnessing to people. Who is not heavy laden? Heck, I'm heavy laden, I'm saved. <laughs> I'm looking for a job for six months. I'm heavy laden. Believe me, I'm heavy laden. Uh, so, but I have a hope that, that, that endureth. So even if you're heavy laden, you have a hope that you are How much more laden are those who are unsaved? Where is their hope? Right? The self-help books? 
I just got into Jordan Peterson. I, I like listening to him. Uh, my son Tim turned me on to him, and he's an interesting guy. But he's not. I don't think he's saved, right? So just like, recently, he, just recently, he accepted the Lord. Really, I did not know that. Well, there you go. So there was a learned man who finally came to the, the, the all the true knowledge. But a lot of his stuff early on, and the things I'm watching, probably before he was saved, are a very secular view. There's no relief in that. And they still are. He's still he's still obeyed in Christ, and he's still trying to apply all that worldly knowledge to to a lot of what he says. Right, and it's easy it's easy to be tossed to and fro from the doctrines of men. Right, it's easy, you know. So we're not. We, we have our. We take upon ourselves our own salvation, our comfort. It gives us peace. So then the question becomes, so that's all established, we all know that. So then the question becomes, okay, how do I share it with people? What's an easy way to share the gospel? And I don't know about you, I don't always do a great job of sharing the gospel. Sometimes I do a really nice job, sometimes I don't. And I find that for myself, where, where the conversations I've had talking about the Lord with people are very personal. They're very personal about my own faith in the Lord. And then sometimes I go through scripture, and, and really what I wanted to do is help us get a roadmap, literally Romans road, roadmap, to walk through scripture to say, like, where, where are easy ways to go through? So when you think about what we're called to believers, to walk through the Romans road, we'll get that to a second. So we are called as, as, as believers to share the gospel. So we're in Matthew, so let's go to Matthew 28. Matthew 28, 19 and 20. So what are we called to do? We are called, we are called therefore go and make disciples of all nations. Go ye therefore and teach all the nations, baptize them in the name of the, of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost teaching them to preserve all things, whosoever I have commanded you, for lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world, amen. So we're, but like, when I was new saved, when I was newly saved, I used to think, well, that's the pastor's job. Like, pastor will do that. Like somebody who's a preacher, I was a Catholic, Catholic priest will do that. Um, but, but I've come to realize as I've gotten older that the most powerful way that we're called, we're all called to do that. We're all called to go out and share our salvation experience. And the scripture call, talks to this, although it's written, go therefore, teach all nations, baptize them in the name of my Father. Who is, who's doing the baptizing? Not us. It's the Holy Spirit that's doing the baptizing, right? Mm -hmm. So when you're giving God's word out, the Holy Spirit is going to intercede in that. And when I used to read this, I would sometimes say, well, baptize, like John the Baptist, I have to dump him in water. That's not the case. It, it, it's, it's, the, it's giving God's word, and the word, the power of the word is unto salvation. So that's what we're called to do that. And then when you look at, we're going to go to Romans in a second, but when you look at that, there's no shame in that. There's actually joy in that. Because you go back to what you talked about, our God's yoke is light. We're complete in him. Our salvation is complete. There's nothing more we can do. So we should be confident and share that. And then the other verse I want to talk about, just setting this up before we go into the Romans word, go to 1 Peter and go to 3, 15, 16. I love this, this verse. Because this is like it. When you think about yourself, And Peter, so when I'm prepping, I'm saying, you know, Bob does a good job of giving the context of the scripture. So 1 Peter is written really to all believers and in general focuses on the importance of a believer bearing up under unjust suffering. And 1 Peter was written to provide encouragement for the true, true believer to continue in the way Jesus has laid out for his following. So then you go to 1 Peter 3, 15, 16. 
but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you, a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear, having a good conscience that therefore they speak evil of you as of evildoers, they may be ashamed that falsely accuses your good conversation in Christ, for it is better if the will of God be so that you suffer for well-doing than for evil. So what are we called to do? We're called to be prepared and do it in meekness and truth. Um, in our family, our house rule is anybody's walking in our house. My son Tim has had folks come from school who you know, have some personal choices around their orientation that, that you would say, well, they're, they're a certain way. I love that they come to our house. I love that they come to our house because we don't judge them. We openly live Christ as Christians. We share the gospel, in, whether directly or indirectly, in our actions. And my hope is that because we share it in meekness and in truth, these folks start to see Christ and why we have hope. Why we are, you know, not burdened. Not that we have to want problems, but we're, we're not burdened. And, and when you look at that and you say, wow, what's different about these people? That's the beginning of allowing the gospel to get in. It's the beginning of letting people have ears to hear. Because you can preach at them. Like, I never like, now this is not right it's a total preference. I never like when people get up on a corner with a bullhorn and say, you're going to hell. Now, that's all true. It is. Right, and, and I, some people were called to do that, but I always felt, maybe right or wrong, that that's not a way to connect with people. Maybe it is, but I found it more powerful to just talk to people and share the gospel in meekness and in truth, because people have more ears to hear than when you beat them on the head with it. Um, and so, like I looked at these scriptures and said, okay, so that sets the stage. So we're saved, it covers everything, you're calling us to do it. You're telling us to do it in meekness and in truth. So how do we do it? So welcome to the Romans Road. <laughs> Romans Road has five parts. There's a problem with sin. There's a wage of sin. There's the gift of God. There's our response to God. And there's the outcome of our salvation. And if anybody wants my notes, I can email them to you. I can put them on the church thing. It's actually pretty cool. But Romans wrote, first you start in Romans 3. What is the problem with sin? Well, we all know the problem with sin. Sometimes folks don't know the problem with sin. They like sin. But it's not to like, right? And my wife said to me, I'm trying to lose weight. She said, you can struggle with discipline to not, not eat bad things, or you can struggle with discipline to be unhealthy. You're going to struggle with something. So with sin, folks may not see the, the problem with sin. But that's where, going back to in a meekness and truth, you can point to the scripture and show them what the wage of sin is. And we a lot of these, a lot of these um, verses we will know and love. So Romans 3, 23. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption of Jesus Christ. That's later. But everybody has sinned and fall short. And, and I talked earlier about my own personal testimony. My, my, my testimony is when I was 18, I started dating Jenny. And we went on our first date. We actually argued. Imagine that. And, and we're sitting in the car and we argued. And we argued over what salvation. I was a good Catholic. I went twice a year. Right? I went to I went on Christmas and I went on, and on Easter. That was it. And I went, oh, I, sometimes I would go on Palm Sunday. Maybe three times. But morally, I was justified by my own mind. And I'm sitting with her, and, and we went out and we talked, and she's like, she was talking to me and witnessing to me around what the problem with sin is. And the difference between, rel here's a cool term, relative context. Relative context means if this is big compared to a cap, this is small compared to a larger camel. Relative context, right? Depends on what you compare it to. So when I looked at sin as an unbeliever, my relative context was, I'm not a murderer. I'm not, I'm not all these things. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a good guy. 
My scales are good. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a believer. My scales are a little higher on this side. But that's not God's definition. Sin, and this is where our, when, as we witness to people, that sin, any sin, separates you from God. And when you're separated from God, because God is holy and God is perfect, all have sinned. All fall short of the glory of God. Well, why is that? Well, it, it starts with Adam. You know, so let's go to Romans 3.10. So we're going to go through that now. So Romans 3.10 is really cool. Romans 3.10 says, For it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. <clears throat> not one. There is none that understandeth, there is none that seeketh after God. We saw that with the Jews. Throughout their every, their, they saw God's love firsthand, and they continued to fall away. They have all gone out of the ways that are together become unprofitable in is none that doeth good, no, not one. Their throat is open is an open sepulchre, their tongues have used deceit, the poison of asp is in their lips. Really, really pleasant picture here. Their mouths are full of cursing and bitterness, their feet are swift to shed blood, destruction and misery are their ways, their ways of peace, they are not known. There's, here's the key. There is no fear of God before their eyes. So in their own minds, this is mankind. This is, without Christ, all of us, all of us are this. Maybe not to that degree, and, and but I would submit to you without the Lord, yes, to that degree. So here we are. The problem with sin is everybody sins. Our human nature is sin. And say what you want, it started with Adam. So here is that we set the problem up. So as you witness to people, you have to... And you probably all know this. I just thought this was a cool topic. You know, you talk to people like, I'm a good guy. I, you know, I'm not a bad person. I, I, or, my works outweigh the bad. That's the wrong definition. It's the wrong context definition. The absolute definition, God's eyes, God is perfect. Are you perfect? No. Okay, let me show you the scripture. Here's the problem with sin. You agree that you fit this definition. And they're gonna, you're going to say yes, because everyone Fall short. So, so once there's agreement on the problem of sin, then we go to Romans six. So you got Romans two twenty three, you got Romans three eighteen uh, ten to eighteen. You can even go to Romans five twelve, which talks about Adam. We won't go there. See, now I know how Bob does it. And man, the time goes. Um, so what's the wage of sin? Go to Romans six twenty three. Simple. You don't have to go there, but I'll read it. For the wage of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ the Lord. And, and words count, right? Definitions count. They matter. When, when, as an unbeliever, you can look at the wage of sin as death, like I'm still alive. Play the then what game with people. So you got a, you got, you graduated college. Great. Then what? I got a job. Great. Then what? Had a family. Great, then what? Ruined my career. Great, then what? Bought a second house. Great, then what? Then I retired. Great, then what? Oh, then we saw my grandkids. Great, then what? Then I saw my grandkids grow up. Great, then what? <laughs> Eventually, it's then you die. Then the question is, then what? Right? You can get so focused um, when you look at the words around death, people look at a material death. It's not. Getting people to understand that the weight of sin, the cost of sin, is separation from God eternally. Mm -hmm. Eternally is, is the beginning of the fear of the Lord. Because, like, right now we have this small amount of time on this planet. It's this small. You think about it, right? And, and, and knowing that, without the fear of the Lord, you think this is it. But it's not. And if you can get people to understand as you witness to them, and you, you take your example, that there's a problem with sin, and then the wage of sin is death, not physical death, spiritual death, and separation from the Lord, then it's like, okay, but read the second half of 23, which is, which is like God always gives us away. The second half of 23, the wage of sin is death, that's the problem. Conclusion, the gift of life, Gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So 
it's through the Lord you don't have to die eternally. You can live forever with him and reign with him forever. Go to Romans 5, 5 8. But God commanded his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. I just told you we're all sinners. I just told you the problem with sin is death and separation from God forever. I just also showed you that God's love through Jesus Christ will save you. Why? We, re we sang the old rugged cross. We sang the songs about God dying on the cross for us. For God commanded his love toward us that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for me, us, me, you, everybody. So, like, think about that. This book is 2,000 years old. We're still talking about it. So it's, it's preserved in its purity because God loved us so much that he sent his son to die for us. He also gave us an example in the Old Testament to show you that all the works in the world aren't going to make you right with God. If anybody ever saw God, the Jews saw God. The Jews saw God in the, in the, in the wilderness. They, they saw him throughout their lives. They had the ark. They had all these things. They required a sign. God gave them signs. They ignored them. They fell away. They pursued other gods. But God knew it. So that's why he sent his son. It's for all of us. So before that happened, here we are, Greg and Jemmy, all this, this nice, beautiful, lovely Hamlet of a church, which we all love. We're in this little place called Millbury. It's 2022. 2,000 some odd years ago, died, Christ died for all of us. Each of us. Why? So we don't have to go to hell. It's pretty awesome. You know, it gives me peace when, 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 when things get tough. You know, it, but if you're unsaved and you don't realize that the wage of sin is death, you're going to be separated from God, yet you have a conclusion, then, you, then your hope is what built on anything you could do. And that's why Romans Road is so cool. Um, go to Isaiah 53. You know, the book of Isaiah points to Christ all over it. Great, it's one of the books where I have marked up. Uh, and on Isaiah 53, verse 5. Okay, I gotta, I gotta do a Bob. I gotta go to verse 1, sorry. Um, who hath believed our report? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he is grown up before him as tender plant and as root of our dry ground and hath no form or completeness when we shall see him and there is no beauty that we should desire him. He that despiseth and rejected of men, a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief, and we hid as, as we were our faces from him, he was despised and yet we esteemed him not. Mm -hmm. Surely he hath bore our grief and carried our sorrows, yet we did not esteem him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. For he was wounded for our transgressions, he was buried for our iniquity, the chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. So just think about that for a second. So if you're an unbeliever, most folks, when you look at the world through a very worldly eye, we'll look at either a self-centered view or a cynical view. Oscar Wilde said, most men live lives of quiet desperation. And it's actually a really good quote, and it sums up the world in a nutshell. Most folks will go through life and they won't even think about their, their well-being with God. But if you can get them, through God's word, to really see the course of their sin, and if they have ears to hear, and that's the word of the Holy Spirit from them, then you can start to share the joy that you have. One of the most famous verses for salvation is John 3.16. You can go there, we all know it. You know, and and but when you think about it, let's go, let's go, let's go there. No, I'm doing the let's go. Uh, so we're going to John. And everybody reads verse 316. It's a good verse. Gotta read a little more. Okay. Go to 15. 
It says, For whoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God sent not his Son unto the world to condemn the world, but the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he had not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. So, the power, I mean, that you could, you could witness somebody just on John. Um, but the gift of God is, is, is eternal life. The gift of God is salvation. The gift of God, through once salvation occurs, for sanctification, is living a better life on this earth. Now, that's not a promise. You know, we don't, the life on this earth is not the goal. I mean, it is, but it's not. Eternal salvation is the goal. Eternal. There's eternal security with the Lord is completeness in Him. And how? how? How does somebody become saved? Well, the part of the Romans road, our response to God, go to Romans 10, 13. 10, 13 takes us through that. So, and if you go, if you go from, actually with those Romans, we'll go from Romans Okay, first, I'm going to start in verse 1. Sorry. Um, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. For I bear record that we have a zeal of God that not according to knowledge, but for being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. Stop. That's us without Christ. That's the world. Think about it. For they are being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. Right there, that's the world. For Christ is the, is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. For Moses described righteousness, which is of the law, that the man that doeth those things shall, be, shall live by them. But the righteousness, which is of faith, speak it unto this wise. Say not in thy heart, who shall ascend to heaven, that is, for bring Christ down from above, or who shall descend into the deep, that is, to bring Christ again from the dead. But what say it? The word is nigh, that even in thy mouth and in thy heart, that is, the word of faith which is preached, which is we preached, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thy heart that God had raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. That's it. For with the heart man believeth with unto righteousness, and with the mouth profession is made unto salvation. For the scripture saith, whoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. Simple. It's actually it's too simple. But it's awesome, right? It's too simple. And in, in looking looking at salvation through a worldly view, it's hard to reconcile. We're brought up to live like what we can do, how I can earn my faith, how you can earn your way. And even like in religion, religion is big with making you earn your keep. When I was a Catholic, you would feel guilty if you didn't go into the, the confessional. And I hated going to the confessional. I just hated it because it just... I would talk to this person and then through my conversation and prayer, I'm, I'm righteous with God. Think about that. God wasn't so complete. And this says the exact opposite. All you need to do, acknowledge your sin, believe that Jesus Christ died for you. Mm -hmm. What else? Nothing. Nothing. <laughs> Nothing. And, and that's where, when you set up the cost of sin and the wage of sin, and then you set up the summit. People, the biggest thing is disbelief, right? The biggest thing is that's, that can't be true. That can't be true. And and that's that can't be true if you don't believe it. <laughs> if you if, just because you don't believe something doesn't mean it's true or not true. Truth is absolute. Do you agree? Like truth is absolute. The question becomes: Is this the truth? I believe it is. Mm -hmm. So if you get 
Acknowledgement as you witness to people, is this, you believe that what I'm going to read to you is true? Then, then, then you, you have something to work with because he did it all. Um, go, go, to, go back to five. I told you we're going to be in Romans. I love Romans. Romans is a great book. Wednesday night. We, we, we just finished 10 last week. Um, Romans 5, 1 and 2. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, with whom also we have access by faith into his grace, wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. It's a beautiful verse. Beautiful verses there. It's justified by faith alone. That's it. You have nothing, you want nothing else. There's nothing else to do. I'm, 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 there's, there's so many verses in here. I'm just trying to pare it down a little bit. Um, we belong. So Romans eight talks about we belong to Christ. We have no more common condemnation in those in, in Christ. Let's go to. It's not Romans row, but let's go to Corinthians. Go to Corinthians two. We're going to read from seventeen to twenty-one. I'm going to read uh, first or second Corinthians. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, 2 Corinthians 5, 17 to 21. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things passed away, are passed away. Behold, all things become new. And all things are of God. Just think about that for a second. All things are of God once you're, you're saved. That all things are new. You're a different person. Think about your, I go back to you me. Think about your life pre-Christ, pre-salvation. Compare it to now. Different. It's different. It can't be anything but different. Because when you're in the world, you think of the world. You focus on the world. You meditate on the world. You glory in the world. You pursue the world. When you're in Christ, you think about Christ. You glorify Christ. You sanctify Him under the word. You share that, not from a position of better than anything. If you share from a whole position of hope, that you, 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 your hope is nothing less, right? Than Jesus loving right. Well, that song, but but like that that that's a that's a that's a really cool thing. So you read I'm reading this and saying, to wit, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto Him, not imputing their trespasses unto them. And that committed unto us the word of reconciliation. So now we're reconciled through our salvation with God, and anyone we speak to can be also. Now that we are now, oh geez, now that we are ambassadors for Christ, as through God did beseech you by this, we pray you in Christ's stead, he be reconciled to God. For he hath made him to be to be sin for us who do no sin, that we might be made righteous of God in him. And I have a note in my Bible, in imputation. God has done it all. So the outcome of our salvation, so you have, when, you, when you're witnessing to people, the problem of sin is pretty simple, right? Acknowledging that. The wage of sin is death and separation from God forever, once we die. The gift of God through Jesus Christ is our salvation. Our response to God, so how do we get it? We just believe. That's all you have to do. And what's the outcome? We're forever reconciled with God. Forever. Can you lose your salvation? You cannot. Period. Because that would, that would nullify grace's power. Simple. Like, okay, that person says they're saved, they're living a terrible life. Okay. Let's talk about that. Whether they're saved, that's between them and God. You can go to the book. James says you'll know them by their fruits. Okay, written to the Jews, that's one thing. But secondly, secondly, none of us are an example of Christ. Christ is an example of Christ. We're all still broken. And right? So when you look at it that way, yeah, you can look at me. This fault, of course, this fault. Guys, we're Brooklyn, this fault everywhere. 
right? I get it. But I'm not the example. I'm not going to get you right with God. And that's the power of witnessing to people through your own testimony. Because by sharing your own and acknowledging your own faults, I'm not saying you have to, like, divulge your whole life, but by sharing your faults around where you struggled and where what God has meant to you, coupled with the scripture, is pretty powerful. Now, I do want to close, before we give communion, uh, I do want to go to Luke. This is one of my favorite stories in the Bible. We're going to go to Luke 11, and we're going to read, I'm going to read. I think I'm getting old enough that I'm going to need a big print Bible. <laughs> I like it. 39 to 43. And one of the malefactors which were nailed, nailed, hanged, nailed unto him, saying, If thou be Christ, Save thyself and us. Needless to say, God, Christ was saving us. We were already. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Uh, yeah. Luke 23. Yep. Yeah. Oh. Chapter 23, 39 to 43. Sorry. So 23. Okay. So 23, 39 to 43, we're going to read. Mm -hmm. And one of the malefactors, which was hanged, now on him saying, If thou be Christ, save thyself and us. But the other answering rebuked him, saying, Dost not thou fear God, seeing thou art in the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we have received the due reward of our deeds. But this man hath done nothing amiss. And he said unto Jesus, Lord, Remember me when thou comest unto thy kingdom. And God said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, Today shall be with thee, thou shalt be with me in paradise. What did that person do for salvation? Nothing. It's the most powerful thing that we have. It's a great example. Because God in his dying moments gave us a, gave us a choice. The two thieves had a choice. Christ did suffer this and many other things. I saw this up here. I'm like, wow, it's pretty amazing. Wow, right? The thieves got what they deserved. And even though they were justly sentenced for their consequence, God still forgave them. And he did it for us. And that's how I think when we share our message to other people, we can relate. We can have them relate. Because in the end, when you start thinking, then what? In the end, we all die. And then to be thoughtful on what happens after is the beginning of the fear of the Lord. And if folks don't have the fear, you know, I used to think I had to get people saved on the spot. I used to, when I was a new, a new Christian, um, we used to go um, to a place called the Bowery Mission in New York. And it was awesome. You'd go there, it was 500 people would come in and we would preach. Um, and and, and you feed them. And I used to think, and, and people would get, Excited, the whole 19 people raised their hands. And as I used to go, I stopped caring about that. Because I realized that the power of the God's word would not come back void. And it may not be in that moment where somebody would get saved, but what we're looking for is true salvation. Not somebody raising their hand, although that's wonderful if it's true. It's not the goal. The goal is to be faithful. We're called to bring the gospel. That's our responsibility, to be not ashamed to share it openly, to be prepared to share it openly, right? To be able to navigate the scripture in an easy way, to do it in meekness and in truth. Then it's not us. God, you know, it does say, and one of you more well versed than me, you know, no one will be able to tell us where this is. No one can say they didn't know about God. No one can say that, especially in this country. Oh my gosh, right? Oh my gosh, you, 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 it's here whether you like it or not. So I would just, encourage us, me too, that when folks want to hear the gospel, share it. You know, I, I don't not want to be on a, to get a bullhorn out, but always be prepared, like it says in First Peter, to give testimony of the joy you have. And it is a real joy. 
for us, I mean, we see it in our lives. And it's a, it's a wonderful, it's a humbling thing that God can die for us, die for me, die for my family, die for all of you, my brothers and sisters in Christ. And, and you know, we've never been a church about numbers, but we've been a church about quality and content. And that's the most important thing, about worshiping the true Lord. And uh, I just hope you're encouraged, and I know I am. I know the world can, can, can uh, choke us up, um, and I know people can be downtrodden, and, and you know, then what is powerful? Because then you're looking at a, a salvation in eternal place. So uh, with that, I'm going to close in prayer, and we're going to do communion. And um, let's just do that first. Uh, Heavenly Father, Lord, we just want to thank you for our time together, Lord. And I pray, Lord, this was edifying, Lord, and I just thank you, Lord, for the, the ability to prepare it and just continue to bless our church in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, Hey, Mike and Dennis, can you guys help? Sure. Yeah, we're going to do communion. So, um, just for courtesy for a second. So, I'm going to read. So, once a month, we do we do communion. And Bob said to me, do you, what do you want to do? And I said, well, let's just do it as we always do. Let's just keep on track. I'm, I'm, if you look, the numbers are perfect. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a little anal-retentive, I'll be the first to say it. Um, I like keeping things on track.